chocolate chip cookie. You can't do it. Okay? If you eat a Big Mac, you have to bicycle for five hours. You cannot do it. No one can do it. Maybe Lance Armstrong can do it, but no one else can do it. Okay? This is a joke. Here's why exercise is important. Because it improves muscle insulin sensitivity, which keeps you healthy. It reduces stress. It's your endogenous stress reducer. So cortisol goes down, and when cortisol goes down, you eat less. And lastly, that mitochondria, which chewed those um, calories up to make the fat that I showed you in the VLDL, if you could make that run faster, you wouldn't have the substrate to turn it into fat. And that will therefore mean that the fat doesn't lodge in the liver, you don't get fatty liver, and therefore your insulin sensitivity improves. And if your insulin sensitivity improves, your levels can go down, in which case it doesn't block your leptin, in which case you might actually eat less. Why is fiber important in obesity? Remember I told you, they took the fiber away. Why do we care? Because fiber is an essential nutrient, but the USDA doesn't call it that. Why doesn't the USDA call fiber an essential nutrient? Because if fiber were an essential nutrient, we couldn't sell food abroad. 25% of our food exports, uh, sorry, 25 percent of our exports are food. If we're taking something important out of the food, why should people buy it? So we don't call fiber important because we couldn't sell food abroad. So the government wants it to be this way because that's how they make money. But is that good for you? So why is fiber important? I like to say in clinic, when God made the poison, he packaged it with the antidote. Wherever there's fructose in nature, there's way more fiber. In fact, if you did a, a little scattergram of all the fruits and all the vegetables against the fiber, they actually fit on a line. So the more fructose, the more fiber. The only um, uh, exception to that is grapes. They have more fructose than fiber. So I don't know, you know, but if you turn it into red wine, it's okay. Okay? Here's what fiber does. It actually acts as a barrier inside your intestine. It acts like a gel. It forms a gel inside the lumen of your intestine, which reduces how fast you absorb the sugar from the gut into the bloodstream, thereby reducing how fast in your addition, liver has to deal with it increases with the, the speed of transit of intestinal contents. So it's not contents, just a dose issue, it's down a the intestine so you get the satiety signal sooner. And lastly, it inhibits the absorption of some fats into the colon, and therefore they go into the colon, they get metabolized to something called short-chain fatty acids, which then get absorbed and suppress insulin. Problem is in the process, those um, bacteria create hydrogen sulfide gas. So in my world, it's either fat or fart. <laughs> and indeed, that's one of the reasons why we haven't uh, been too upset about the loss of fiber, because it reduces the social aspects <laughs> of food. So here's chronic ethanol exposure over here, okay? and here's chronic fructose exposure over here, 8 out of 12, because they're basically the same. And it makes sense that they should be. Because after all, where do you get ethanol from? Fermentation of fructose. It's called winemaking. We do it in Napa Valley every day. The big difference is that for ethanol, the first step in metabolism called glycolysis, the yeast does. And for fructose, we do our own. After that, when they hit the mitochondria, they're the same. And so they cause the same diseases in the same way, in the same level. So what's the difference? Sorry about the... Uh, uh, the uh, tabbing here. Here's a can of Coke, here's a can of beer. 150 calories both. So the can of Coke, 10.5% sucrose, 75 fructose, 75 glucose. For the can of, uh, al of beer, it's 90 alcohol, 60 maltose, which is glucose. When you do the first pass and you do the math on this, basically the number of calories hitting the liver is exactly the same. There's no difference. So in America we have this thing called beer belly. Well, welcome to soda belly. Because that's what we have. That's what all of our kids are suffering from. And if it's not soda belly, it's juice belly. And if it's not juice belly, it's Gatorade belly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or candy belly, or whatever else you want to call it. Because this is specific, specific to fructose. This has been recognized now at the American Heart Association. I was proud to be a member of this panel that put this scientific statement out two years ago, Dietary Sugars and Cardiovascular Health where we recommended a reduction from the mean currently of 22 teaspoons a day per person down to either nine for males or six for females, a cut by two-thirds to three-quarters in added sugars 
in the diet. That's huge. The food industry went ballistic. They went absolutely insane. Why do you think they went insane? We're hitting them where they live. Okay, this is their juggernaut. This is their gravy train. This is why they went from 1% pro annual profit margin per year prior to 1975 to 5% profit, annual profit margin in 1995 and now two th and 2005. Okay? They quintupled their profits per year when they added high fructose corn syrup because they figured out a way to get us to eat more. So this is a problem for them. But you know what? What they're doing is a problem for you and for the whole world. So I'm going to end. Is this okay, time-wise? Yeah. Okay. Let's rethink that first law of thermodynamics because that's what this is all about. Because if you walk out of here thinking that it's still about diet and exercise, a calorie is a calorie, gluttony and sloth, okay, I have failed. That is not what this is about. Here's how you should state the first law, and it makes way more sense. If you're going to store it, that is, an obligate weight gain set up by biochemical forces out of your control, for instance, the insulin I pumped Maya full of, okay, and you expect to burn it, that is, normal energy expenditure for normal quality of life, right, because energy expenditure and quality of life are the same thing, then you're going to have to eat it. And now, all of a sudden, the two aberrant behaviors are a result of our biochemistry because the biochemistry comes first and the behaviors are a marker for the abnormal biochemistry, not the cause. They are the result, not the cause. Correlation is not causation. And all you have is correlation. I have causation and it goes this way. Everybody got it? So our bi a b a behaviors are a result of our biochemistry, and our biochemistry is a result of our altered environment. Our environment changed the rules. The toxic environment is true. The thing that changed is the sugar and the, sh and the fiber. Those two things together. So what do you need to tell your patients? Three words. Eat real That's it. The problem is they can't afford it. The problem is they have no time to cook it. The problem is they haven't developed a taste to like it. Okay? But what happened? We used to eat real food. Our taste buds have been hijacked. Okay? There's an entire addiction story, which I don't have time to tell you. Maybe you'll invite me back and I'll tell you about the sugar hormones and addiction story. Okay? And what happens to dopamine receptors in the brain. Okay? And all that stuff. But the bottom line is, if you eat a low fructose, high fiber diet, everything else falls into place. The question is, how do you do that on a dollar, you know, when, when you only have a dollar to spend? That's a different question. That's a true societal economic question. Okay? I am not prepared to tell you how to do that today. Okay? What I'm prepared to tell you is that this is what we have to work toward. This is a policy issue. This is a public health issue. This is not a personal responsibility issue. You can help your patients by understanding this. You can help them, them understand it. Okay? They have to understand how bad sugar is. And if they understand how bad sugar is, they might, might, I repeat might, have a chance to actually do something about it. But right now they don't know what to do. So if they eat less Twinkies, it's not going to make any difference, right? They got to eat no Twinkies, right? So eat less, exercise more, doesn't work. Eat less what? Eat less sugar. Okay, um, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, there's, there's more, but time's a waste and, and you know, you've, ha you've had enough. You've been here a long time. Any questions? I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Is it possible?
impossible to touch quickly on um, the biochemistry and how we um, react to sugar alcohols and aspartame. And so it seems like everyone's trying to find a way to substitute fructose. Right. So the question is, why do we need sweet in the first place? I mean, yes, everybody wants some alternative. Okay. And I get this question asked all the time. What sh well, if we can't have sugar, what should we have, right? Yeah, I know, I know. I, I got it, I got it. All right, so here's the problem. Number one, there's this thing called pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics is what your body does to a drug. And then we have this thing called pharmacodynamics. That's what a drug does to your body. They're not the same. You know that, you know that, okay? They're not the same. We have all the pharmacokinetics for all of the non-nutritive sweeteners. We have to have them. The FDA demanded them in order to make them over the counter. So we have all the pharmacokinetics. We have no pharmacodynamics. None. Zero. Zilcho. Nada. Why? Because it could only hurt their sales. They don't want to know. Okay? The FDA didn't ask for it. All they wanted to know is it was safe and effective. Okay? What we want to know is what do non nutritive sweeteners do to your dopamine receptors? What does non nutritive sweeteners do to your insulin? What does your non nutritive sweeteners do to your GLP 1? What does it do to your satiety? What does it do to your long term weight regulation? That's what we want to know. We have no data because the food industry doesn't want to do it because it can't help them, it can only hurt them. Okay? So I can't recommend any of them because I don't know. Okay? I can't do those studies. Those cost a lot of money. Only the food industry could do them. The NIH could do them, but they won't do them because they say, well, that's the food industry's job. So the answer is, I don't know. Now, with respect to sugar alcohols, sugar alcohols are relatively sweet. They're not very sweet. They're a little sweet. They have a little bit of an aftertaste frequently, you know, like uh, uh, xylitol, erythritol, sorbitol, etc. The thing is that they don't get absorbed in the intestine. That's true, they don't get absorbed in the intestine, although um, xylitol actually does get absorbed eventually. But um, uh, most of them stay in the intestine, and they act as osmolites. They basically hold on to water. So if you consume any reasonable amount of this stuff, it causes bloating and diarrhea. Now, can you get past that? If you, you know, use the right amounts, you know, that's what people are doing. You know, if you're chewing a hard candy and, you know, it's got some erythritol in it, you know, like no big deal, you know, it doesn't leave your intestine. So, you know, that's better, I guess. The question is, what does that do to your dopamine receptors? Because there's plenty of data in animals that shows that when you basically supply the animal with sweet, whether it's sugar or not, that the dopamine receptors still go down, and that means that you need more substrate to get the same level of reward. So basically what you're doing is you're still fomenting the vicious cycle of consumption and uh, addiction. Now, we, do we know that in humans? Not yet. We're, those studies are yet to be done. So, why do, but why do we need sweet? How do, you know, if, when um, Europeans get off the plane for the first time and come to America, and they taste our food for the first time, what do they say? God, this stuff is so sweet. But they're here for two months, you know? They gain 20, exactly. They can't tell the difference and they've gained 20 pounds. We had a uh, German medical student, she was rail thin, rail thin, and her boyfriend told her before she got on the plane from Dresden to come to U San Francisco, do not eat anything over there. I like you the way you are. He knew, he knew. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> well, that too. Of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, does that answer your question? And like aspartame and how yeah. we look at that. I mean, because that's essentially, I mean, it's a breakdown of an amino, it's an amino acid, isn't it? Aspartame is not an amino acid. It's, it's, it's a der der derivative of an amino acid, okay? There are some people who think it causes Alzheimer's. I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, look, bottom line, it's not natural. Yeah. It's synthetic, okay? I'm not telling you that everything that's synthetic is bad, but why do you need it? Why do you need it? Why is everything sweet? You know, when I was a kid, dessert was once a week. Now it's once a meal. Yeah? yeah. Can you talk about what all this means in terms of some of the popular diets like Atkins and South Beach? So, uh, you asked me this question earlier, so uh, this is sort of my, my pet thing. 
So we have lots of diets, right? We have Atkins, we have Ornish, we have South Beach, we have, you know, uh, Sugar Buster Zone, uh, down the line, you know. They, and they're all different, right? No, they're not. They're all the same because they all have one thing in common. They all get rid of sugar. Atkins is all fat, no carb, right? Ornish is all carb, no fat, and they both work. But the one thing they all have is no sugar. Think about it. So that's the question is, do you need to be on a diet? I don't think, I don't believe in diets. I think diets are basically, you know, trumped up ways for, you know, MDs to make money off books. Okay? I do not espouse a diet. I don't think there's a diet for everyone. Now, if you are, if you have familial hypercholesterolemia, you need to be on a low-fat diet or you're going to die. If you have galactosemia, you better be on a low lactose diet or you're going to die. If you have a medical reason for being on a diet, fine. If you're phenylketonuric, you better not have any phenylalanine or you're going to fry your brain. Okay? So if you have a medical reason for being on a diet, fine. But I'm talking about the rest of everybody, okay, which is 99.999999% of the rest of the world. Okay? You don't need to be on a diet. You just need to eat food. So Michael Pollan says, you know, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Take the not too much out because it will take care of itself. Because when you eat real food and you don't have insulin resistance, your brain can see its leptin and you won't eat too much. And that's what we did for five, you know, mil, you know for mil, millennia until we poisoned our, um, our ability to see leptin, which is what insulin does. Insulin blocks leptin signaling. And that's how I got into this business in the first place. As a neuroendocrinologist, that's what I uh, researched. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that. So then you say to me, okay, well, why does insulin block leptin? You know, where'd that come from? What's in it for us? Why would God do that to us? Okay, Here, well, I'll tell you why. Because there are two times in your life you actually have to gain weight. What are they? Puberty and pregnancy. Both of them are insulin resistant states on purpose. And the reason is because if leptin worked right all the time, you could never gain the weight. Because as soon as you ate something, your leptin would go up and your brain would say, I'm not hungry anymore. And so your food intake would go down and you'd stay unstable. And no matter what you did, you couldn't get, you know, get out of that. That's the 97 pound weakling on the, uh, on the beach. Okay? He's got really, really good leptin. So when you're in puberty, you have to gain the weight or the species dies out. When you're in pregnancy, you have to gain the weight or you can't carry the baby to term. So doesn't it make sense that the same thing that causes the weight gain, the insulin, should also block the leptin to allow you to gain the weight? And then when the pregnancy is over and the baby is out and the insulin resistance is over and your insulin levels go back down, you can lose the weight and start all over again. So it actually makes teleologic evolutionary sense that insulin should block leptin. The point is, you're only supposed to be insulin resistant twice in your life. We're insulin resistant every day of our life now. And what did it? That, does that make sense? Okay. That's, that, that goes to the sweet issue, too. Questions? Other questions? Everybody comfortable? Everybody got it? Everybody know what to tell their patients now? Food plate will make a difference? I don't think it will. In the grand scheme of things, I don't think it will because they're going to just basically put processed food on the food plate. <laughs> um, I think that we need to really sort of re-educate the entire populace and our politicians as to what's going on and why this is happening. And I think we have to, ultimately, the food industry will do whatever we tell them to do as long as they keep their profits up. All they care about is the bottom line. They changed in the early 80s when we told them they had to. Okay? They found out they made more money. As long as they can keep their profits up, they'll, they'll change. The question is how to do this and still keep their profits up. That's the policy issue that I'm sort of not prepared to talk about today. All right. Well, thank you so much for...